Welcome to worship with First Christian Church in Black Mountain, North Carolina. Wherever you're worshiping from this morning, whoever you are, we are so glad that you're with us and we pray that you will be blessed through this time of worship. You know the saying, a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. In our scripture reading today, Paul expands on this, noting that knowledge can be good and bad, so let love be the filter through which we process knowledge. What we do with knowledge of God's purposes and how we respond once we come to know Jesus makes all the difference. Let us worship. By this we have known the presence of the Lord, in the rising of the sun, in the smile of another's face, in the touch of a hand or the sound of a laugh. By this we have known the power of the Lord, in the healing of hurts, in the forgiveness of sin, in the shower of love that comes from God's Son. Let us give thanks to the Lord with all our heart, let us worship our God, whose presence and power endures forever. In the light of the morning, the love of God fills our hearts. In the light of the morning, the love of God fills our hearts. Loving and merciful God, we give thanks that you know us and love us. Through the power of your Spirit, help us grow deeper, wider, and fuller in our knowledge and understanding of your ways. Help us bring others closer to you and to your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, let us love each other, because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love does not know God, because God is love. We love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. After all, those who don't love their brothers and sisters whom they have seen can hardly love God whom they have not seen. This commandment we have from Him. Those who claim to love God 
ought to love their brothers and sister also. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Holy and loving God, we give thanks for your presence in the world and in our lives. In a world filled with so much confusion and uncertainty, we rejoice that you've not left us without guidance and direction. You've called us to be your people. Sometimes our lives reflect your loving presence, and in other times they seem loveless and lonely and lost. Yet in all things you do love us, completely and without reservation, and you plant within us the seed for loving others. Nurture that seed within us, we pray. Help us take the risk of opening our often closed hearts to be vulnerable to the others in our lives, to take the risk of love. May your perfect love indeed cast out all fear and enable us to give ourselves anew to those we encounter on this journey with Christ. Help us to remember that there is a whole world of Christians struggling to live lives of service under conditions that we cannot imagine. We pray for them, O oh God. Help us see the needs of the world around us and to seek ways to leave this world a better place for our children and their children. We pray for all who are ill and those who are grieving. May your healing touch bodies and minds. O oh God, help us to remember to place you first in our lives and the rest of our priorities will be in order. We seek your guidance. We pray these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.
All good things come from God. Even the gifts we bring today have first come from God's gracious hand. As followers of Jesus, we're following Jesus when we bring the gifts we have and wholeheartedly put them into service of God. As we offer these gifts, may we submit our hearts, minds, souls, and bodies for Christ's service. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your great generosity. All that we are and all that we have is a gift from you. Help us to serve one another and so reflect your spirit and goodness. Accept these offerings and bless the ministries for which they will be used. Amen. Now concerning meat that has been sacrificed to a false god, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes people arrogant, but love builds people up. If anyone thinks they know something, they don't yet know as much as they should know. But if someone loves God, they are known by God. So concerning the actual food involved in these sacrifices to false gods, we know that a false god isn't anything in this world and that there is no God except for the one God. Granted, there are so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as there are many gods and many lords. However, for us believers, there is one God and Father. All things come from Him, and we belong to Him. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ. All things exist through Him, and we live through Him. But not everybody knows this. Some are eating this food as though it is really food sacrificed to a real idol because they were used to idol worship until now. Their conscience is weak because it has been damaged. Food won't bring us close to God. We're not missing out if we don't eat and we don't have any advantage if we do eat. But watch out, or else this freedom of yours might be a problem for those who are weak. Suppose someone sees you, the person who has knowledge, eating in an idol's temple. Won't the person with the weak conscience be encouraged to eat the meat sacrificed to the false gods? The weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. You sin against Christ if you sin against your brothers and sisters and hurt their weak consciousness this way. This is why if food causes the downfall of my brother or sister, I won't eat meat ever again or else I may cause my brother and sister to fall. I was 10 when I learned about sidewalks. Now, of course, I knew what sidewalks were, but growing up in the Congo, where all we had were dirt roads and footpaths, I hadn't had a lot of experience with sidewalks before we came back to the States for my fifth grade year. We spent the school year in Wayne, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. The elementary school that my brother and I attended was about three quarters of a mile away and we walked every day with some other kids from the neighborhood. One day, one of the kids started chanting the little ditty, step on a crack, break your mother's back. I'd never heard that before, and while I didn't really believe the superstition, it was kind of fun to try and adjust my steps to keep from stepping on a crack in the sidewalk. There was some discussion in our group as to the truthfulness of the saying, and some of the kids, the younger kids, were worried it might be true, or at least they weren't going to take any chances. But then an older boy came along. He was in the sixth grade and was very smart, 
and knew for sure that there was no danger to his mother's back if he stepped on every crack in the sidewalk. He didn't just step on them, he stomped his foot down hard, right on every single crack, just to make his point. This really upset some of the younger kids. This boy was right about cracks in the sidewalk. They had no relationship to anybody's mother's back. But the way he expressed the truth he knew was obnoxious and upsetting to the others. As Paul said to the Corinthians, knowledge makes people arrogant, but love builds up. We just read from a letter the Apostle Paul wrote to a local church. Paul was trying to help this congregation through a squabble. It appears that some of them would like to be free to eat food that had been used in the worship of idols. Since they knew that these idols were no threat to the one true God, that this food was just food, they saw no reason to waste good food. However, others in the church family still worried about the idols. These folks believed that to eat the food that had been used in the worship of idols was to lessen their devotion to God. What was this church family to do? Paul agreed that there was nothing wrong with eating this food, except that to do so wouldn't take seriously the concerns of those who still worried that this would link them with idol worshipers. And so, Paul suggested that there are limitations imposed by love. In this case, those limitations suggested that they not eat the food. Even though those concerned about eating the food were wrong, love for one another took precedence over principles. The principle Paul affirms is this, being right matters, but relationships matter even more. Ideas are important, but people are even more important. Truth matters, but love matters even more. As Paul said later in this letter, love does not insist on its own way. And so while we acknowledge the importance of knowledge and of freedom, we also acknowledge that what should guide our behavior is our love for one another. We are not free to think only of our own response to a situation we have to take into account those affected by our actions. The health of the body of Christ, the church, takes priority over our knowledge and our freedom. Truth matters, but love matters more. Paul is discussing food sacrificed to idols, but he could as easily be discussing face masks and social distancing. Just as the Corinthians were certain of their newfound freedom as followers of Jesus meant that they could disregard the old prohibition against eating such food, we hear people today talking loudly about their individual rights and their freedom to disregard the wearing of face masks. Yes, in this country, we do have many individual freedoms, but we also have knowledge of how viruses spread. And so out of love for others, I willingly wear a mask and follow the other public health guidelines. Paul seems especially concerned about what sort of witness is made when others see the church members squabbling with one another. Therefore, those in the church in Corinth had to be concerned when some couldn't shake the idea that eating food associated with idols was wrong. While Paul doesn't consider it sinful to eat this food, 
he does believe that it would be a sin to cause members of the family to act against their conscience. For Christians, there is a value higher than our knowledge and our freedom. For our knowledge of God is limited and finite anyway, and our freedom does not release us from our responsibility for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to live within the limitations imposed by love. The Corinthians are told that knowledge, while valuable, only puffs up, but love builds up. Paul tells them to consider the other person, that although they all have knowledge, they should consider how to act in love so that they can build one another up. Love welcomes those with very different outlooks. Jews and Greeks, slave and free, male and female, to be one in Christ. Love works to keep the various parts of the community from splintering into opposing factions. Love is how those different points of view can experience genuine community in Christ. Love means that each one of us has to be willing to compromise. It's not somebody else who needs to compromise for us. These are the limitations imposed by love. This doesn't mean that we avoid conflict. In fact, Paul insisted that this particularly difficult issue in the life of the early church be confronted. The church was exactly the place for these difficult discussions. Paul simply urges that every member of the community be taken seriously, for knowledge does not belong to any one part of the church. Faithful and intelligent disciples of Jesus Christ will interpret scripture differently. Therefore, we must listen to each other, really listen, not in order to correct one another, but in order to learn from each other. Our differences are not because some are stupid and some are smart, not because some are moral and others are amoral, rather because our life experiences are different, because our faith experiences are different. We approach scripture and interpret it differently. This is one of the things that we in the Christian church, disciples of Christ, say is important, that each of us has the right and responsibility to interpret scripture through our own experiences and understanding. And most importantly, at some point, it doesn't even matter who is right and who is wrong because Christ has called us to live together as the church. Without dialogue about difficult and important issues, we can easily become proud and arrogant. We risk cutting ourselves off from God's grace by judging, thinking that we are so right that we may believe we don't even need grace. Knowledge tries to convince us that being right is of the highest value. Yet Paul warns the church in Corinth that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Scripture calls us to hold our convictions, but always with humility. Truth matters, but love matters more. As is often the case, working out these differences was important to the life of the church in Corinth. Their central act of worship was the Lord's Supper, eating a meal together. If they had allowed each one to do as their conscience directed them at this meal, their community would have been destroyed. They might have been tempted to claim an irreconcilable impasse rather than to work for reconciliation. But whenever we say something is irreconcilable, 
It is an affront to Jesus Christ who has called us to be the church together. So Paul reminded the Corinthians to be on the lookout for the strong convictions of knowledge and the passions of freedom that could puff them up and cut them off from one another. Likewise, we need to commit ourselves to the love that builds up. Surely Paul's words to the church in Corinth continue to speak to us today, calling us to recognize the limitations imposed by love and to play a reconciling role in our families and in our church community and in the world. Paul's words continue to remind us of the importance of our commitment to be the body of Christ, the church. This doesn't mean we hold back on our differences, but rather that we see our diversity as God's gift to us, a guard against self-righteousness and a reminder that God's ways are not our ways. We need one another in order to more fully discern and practice the will of God. Paul calls us to welcome and accept those with differing points of view in ways that honor and reflect God's welcome and acceptance of each one of us. So may we continue to live within the limitations imposed by love in our homes and in God's house. And may we be blessed with an experience of God's love that is big enough to include us all. Thanks be to God. On this last day of January, most of us are sitting in our own homes, hearing music, prayer, scripture, and sermon from our computer or television. But wherever we are, we take this moment to bring ourselves the best we can to sit at table. Wherever you are, come, for this is a table of remembrance. Remember when you held broken bread and passed it to someone sitting next to you. Remember when you poured the cup and offered it to a companion. Remember when you passed the peace in order to remember your connections as sisters and brothers in Christ. This is the table of remembrance. So bring your memories into this time and place. Remember Jesus pouring a cup of wine, offering it to his disciples saying, I will never again drink it until that day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Remember and be renewed as we share in this meal of remembrance.
that night in the upper room when Jesus was at supper with the disciples, he took a loaf of bread. After giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this bread is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took a cup after giving thanks, he poured it and gave it to them, saying, This cup represents the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Gracious God, we are glad to be here today in your presence. Gladly we come to give you thanks for everything you have done for us. But we are most glad and thankful because you have invited us to come to the table of our Lord Jesus. Grant that we may receive this sacrament of Christ's body and blood, and may we abide in him and he in us. May we be filled with the power of his endless life, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, one world without end. Amen. As often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we remember the Lord's life, death, and resurrection and proclaim his ongoing presence with us. Now may the God who created us, the God who has redeemed us, and the God who gives us power be with you every minute of every day, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>